All righty. So for those of you who have just joined in the last couple seconds, welcome. We are so thrilled to have you joining us this afternoon for uh, this fantastic screening and, uh, and webinar to discuss um, a very important story. Um, and, and we're so delighted that you're interested in, in hearing um, more about uh, this woman's life and, and what her uh, end of life decision looked like. So I'm going to uh, turn it over to my colleague, Nicole, in just a moment to share more uh, about what you're going to experience this afternoon. Um, but before I do, I'll introduce myself. My name is Kelsey Goforth and I'm the Senior Program Manager at Dying with Dignity Canada. Turn it over to you, Nicole. Thanks, Kelsey. Hi, everyone. My name is Nicole Curtis, and I am the program specialist here at Dying with Dignity Canada. Um, so I will do a quick introduction here, and then we'll get uh, the film going. So Kay Lambie lived a quiet and simple life, choosing to spend her time with friends and family, helping those around her however she could. She had a love of collecting ornaments that featured sailors. She had an incredible warmth and most notably, she had a fierce but quiet love for her, grand, for her children and grandchildren. After so much pain and suffering, Kay had reached a point in her life where she couldn't take it anymore. Her granddaughter Riley knelt before her and shared her options. As, some, as somebody who had a religious upbringing and was generally more conser conservative in her beliefs, Kay was not familiar with medical assistance in dying. She had a, an extremely difficult time deciding if this was something she would ever want to consider. The end of life process was not an easy decision. It was a long, painful and emotional process for Kay and her entire family. But the more information and education she received, the more comfortable she became. In the weeks leading to her death, Kay was incredibly positive knowing the end of her suffering was finally in sight. By making it okay for her to talk about wanting to die, her family made the process for her more comfortable, peaceful, and connected. As a filmmaker, Kay's, and as a filmmaker and Kay's grandson, Patrick chose to bring a camera along to what felt like his final visit and document some of Kay's quiet moments for his family to cherish. We share her story with you today to provide space for conversation, an opportunity to raise awareness and further open up the dialogue around medical assistance in dying. In just a few moments, we will premiere Kay's journey. Shortly after, we will bring on Dr. Stephanie Green of the Canadian Association of Maid Assessors and Providers, along with Muse founder and Kay's grandson, Patrick, and his sister, Riley, for a panel discussion and live audience Q&A session. Here is a part of Kay's story. This is a very nice hall with him. Dishcloth. Your dishcloth. That's why I made. I made this. Then you, then Riley should give you some. I, I made her about ten. They're the best dishcloths around. They are made with bonnet. B O N A T. <laughs> you can wash greasy baby ducks with the Dawn dishcloth. So go out and buy two or three of them at once. <laughs> <laughs> oh well. <laughs> Better laugh and cry, right? Um, I feel that I'm I'm ready. I'm ready to uh, I'm ready to do this. I really feel that. I feel that I'm not sorry that I'm doing it. I feel that I want to get some stuff ready in this apartment so Riley doesn't have too much to do. I was thinking this morning about it. Like I, it's always on my mind. Well, not always on my mind, but quite a bit. And I was thinking that, um, oh heck, I've had, I've had needles in my arms. I've had so many needles in my arms. This isn't good. This is going to be a hoot. I can't. I can't. There's a key. So. What is this main thing? Assisted dying. I don't like to say suicide. What, what is it? Assisted what? Death. Yeah. Assisted death. Assisted dying. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But the, the, it's the initials. What does it mean? Medical assistance in death. Okay. Yeah. This 
stuff takes your mind off everything. Just when I want to show off. <laughs> <laughs> Where did you say? Oh, there it is. Yeah, there it is. Yeah. Was, was that an easy decision for you, though? Or a hard one? Oh, it was really easy. When I was in all that pain and everything, that was a relief. I was just hoping when Riley was telling me and that about the doctors and that, and I, I was just hoping that they'd accept me. I know we're here. So, so deciding to do the euthanasia or the main. Uh huh. The hardest part? Yeah. Not, not being able to see you kids anymore. Not being able to see Caleb and Nora and Bella anymore. Not seeing them, being able to see them grow up too, you know? I won't know. I've always seen my grandkids, you know, and been there and watched them. I was very quiet about it, but I used to watch what they were doing, and making the egg sandwich. Grammy, you make the best egg salad sandwiches. <laughs> I didn't want you to be hurt because I wasn't letting you help me. I wanted to get it across to you. But... There we go. Done like dinner. You're tough. Yeah. No, well, I guess I am. Well, I, I won't say it again. Great, great. <laughs> Raising four, four kids by yourself while putting yourself through hairstyling school? Yeah. That's not tough at all? Yeah, I guess, yeah. Yeah. Hands are pretty strong. Want me to help you? I've got them, I think, this time. Yeah. <laughs> That'd be you, singing in the rain. I'm singing, just singing in the rain. How did you choose a date for me? How did I do that? Yeah. Very quickly. Purpose, then. It's amazing. <laughs> and you can go home to your girls pretty soon. And Ella's walking now. Oh, yeah. Thank you for taking us in so But then is it, but this has really, really been worked out well, eh? I'm washed out in sorrow. All right, so I. Lillian, uh, FFK, Lambie, um, hereby consent to undergo medical assistance in dying. I confirm I have a serious and incurable illness, disease, or disability which causes me enduring suffering that is intolerable to me and cannot be relieved under conditions that I consider acceptable. Okay, I confirm, I further confirm I am in an advanced state of irreversible decline and capability and my natural death has become reasonably foreseeable. Okay. Mm -hmm. I understand in particular that the drugs to be administered to me today are intended to cause my death and I further understand that by consenting to, the, to made today I will die which is earlier than when my natural death was likely to occur. Mm -hmm. Right? Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm a little bit leery what's on the other side, you know, like nobody really knows, eh? But we know that Kelly and Scott are waiting there with open arms, yeah, that's for sure. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's for sure. Yeah. You like to believe. Yeah. yeah. To look the same. And I don't know why you're cold when it's all gone. Be a beast. I don't know. So, so deserved. <laughs> Tell you what you want. She's got close her eyes. They're old enough that they can kind of understand and they can, you know, we can say, hey, come meet your, your great-grandma. What would you want them to know? 
that I love them very much. I, I'm doing it because I have to leave. I have to go away. Be good human beings. Be kind. Be thoughtful. Be caring. Be loving. Have faith in themselves and believe in themselves. Have confidence and uh, be strong. Wow, that was so powerful and emotional. I hope everybody enjoyed that. Um, we're just pulling up our panelists um, so that we can get started on our, our Q&A. And as Kelsey mentioned at the beginning, there will be some room for um, audience Q&A. So if you have any questions for um, our panelists, please feel free to message us uh, and we'll try and get to as many as we can. So. Here come our panelists. Hi, everyone. Hi. Hi. All right, great, everyone is here. Okay, so um, why don't we start by getting you all to introduce yourselves. Um, Patrick, I'll let you start. Uh, I am Patrick. Uh, I was Kay's uh, grandson, and uh, I'm a filmmaker who really just, you know, uh, believes in telling stories that can make a difference. And so uh, when all of this happened, uh, I had a conversation with Graham about the idea of, of documenting the process and, and really getting to know her and, you know, sharing all of her thoughts. And so we did several interviews and, um, and I just brought a camera along to kind of share the journey. Wow, thank you. Uh, Riley, how about you go next? I'm Riley. <laughs> um, I am Kay's granddaughter, Patrick's little sister. Um, I, I've been an ICU nurse for about 10 years now. Um, so I've had a lot of experience with palliative care and now maid. And um, I was pretty much my grandma's in-home nurse for a lot of the years towards the end. So. Um, really got to know her a lot better and also just see truly her struggle with everything and was really glad that I was able to to offer her some support through MAID in the end by you know, educating her about that option and yeah being able to help her along the way. Thank you and Stephanie would you like to introduce yourself next? Oh you're on mute. <laughs> There we go. Thanks. Yeah, I, I'm Stephanie Green, and thank you so much for inviting me to the panel today. And uh, and special thanks to the family for sharing the story. I think it's very powerful and really courageous of you to do this. So so I'm really honored to be part of this. Thank you. Uh, I am uh, I'm I'm here because I'm I'm trained as a family physician. I spent much of my career in maternity and newborn care, but since 2016, I focused my practice on assisted dying, and I. I have the privilege of working with people in end of life uh, in Victoria, British Columbia, where I work and live, and I am I'm a maid assessor and provider. I am also the co-founder and president of CAMAP, the Canadian Association of uh, Maid Assessors and Providers, the, the national nonprofit that supports the diversity of professionals that do this work across our country. And uh, I've only very recently become comfortable with adding that I'm an author of an upcoming book on my first year of providing maid, uh, which will be out next year. So really grateful to be here. Thank you. Wow, awesome. Thank you. And thank you all for joining. Um, I just wanted to mention Kelsey is having some audio issues. So I will just take over from here, continue taking over from here. So um, let's get started uh, with some questions. Um, and we'll start with you, Patrick. So I mean, we just had a had a 
got a chance to see Kay um, at the end of her life. Um, but you can, can you tell us a little bit more about her and, and who she was? Yeah, um, <clears throat> she was just a wonderful, caring person. And uh, something I'll always remember, the, the morning of the procedure, um, she had a call from one of the uh, nurses that had helped her. Um, and just to kind of check in and, you know, say some final words. And this is maybe two hours before the procedure and Kay's on the phone and she's like, you said your husband wasn't well, how's he doing? Is he feeling better? And like the majority of the conversation was her asking about the nurse's husband and like how they were doing. Um, and I think that just exemplifies who she was. She was always just trying to care for and be there for other people. Oh. You could get a sense of that even just from that short short clip, but that's that's great. And um, I'll just keep it with you, Patrick, for a sec. Um, what was your reaction when you learned that Kay was considering made? Yeah, um, so Riley has a lot more of the context because I live in Portland and she lived in the same small uh, town with Graham and she was the in-house nurse. So I wanna be clear that like when I heard about it, it was definitely after they had had many other conversations. Um, but I got a phone call and we were just talking about how she was in general. And the idea that she just brought up that she was, um, she was thinking about this, she wanted to talk to her doctor about it, you know, that it was on her mind to me meant that, you know, things were very serious. Um, and I, I knew that if, um, if she was willing to say that out loud, <laughs> it must mean that there was, there was so much more going on inside of her, because I know that that was not easy for her to bring up on a phone call that, you know, she wanted to talk about this. Right. Yeah. And Riley, um, so we understand that uh, Kay had a difficult time coming to the decision um, to access made, but also um, you had some conversations with her about it and Patrick had kind of just um, allotted to that. Can you explain a little bit more of the conversations you had with her and, and the options and whatnot? Well, um, she suffered for a long time. Um, unfortunately, she had a really rough go in her last chunk of life. So I think for maybe 10 years prior, she had a cancer diagnosis that she had severe complications and a lot of pain and suffering. And um, my mom was still around then and she was also a nurse. And I remember her maid wasn't really, it wasn't an option then, but um, my mom had some palliative background. So we had talked to her about that, but she was not even ready to approach it. She was still very much in a fighting stage and there was still a lot of hope. And as the years went on and there was more and more pain and more and more complications and things just, she had less and less quality of life. Um, in the last maybe two years, she had a lot of suffering and a lot of ups and downs. And we started to talk more and more about different options when she just wasn't getting relief from what she was able to be offered. Um, and I think that religion played a large part in why she was so hesitant about made for a long time. We had a lot of talks about how she, for, she just felt that she couldn't and she couldn't really explain why but um eventually after you know the pain just had gotten so severe and she realized that you know there wasn't really any other way out um we talked more and more about you know the difference between palliative care and actually going through with maid or you know the other medical options that have been offered to her, which were, you know, surgery and things that she, she didn't want and probably couldn't tolerate anyways. And I think just the more that she, she thought about it and learned about it, she, she realized what, a, what a beautiful option that it could be. And it really, really was once we got the process initiated, everybody we encountered along the way was so helpful and wonderful and thoughtful and caring and just made her feel you know, every question was ans answered um, and just made her feel like she was making the right decision. Right. So it, yeah. it was a beautiful process. Mm -hmm. And do you feel like you're, because you have a, a healthcare background, so do you feel like that prepared you for the experience at all? Definitely. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. I, uh, having a background in critical care, I've seen a lot of suffering over the years and actually palliated countless patients. Um, and now that MAID is, is available, um, it, it's just opening doors for a lot of people who um, would otherwise be looking at a long, long time of, of suffering. Right. Um, and so 
being able to talk to her about what she could expect and you know what things would look like I think also really helped her feel at ease um, because I'd, I'd helped others through it so she felt comfortable talking to me about it and you know that I could tell her what what she might experience so mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah um, okay so Stephanie let me just loop you in and switch gears for a moment so can you, um, your experience as a maid provider, can you tell us how you decided to become a maid provider? Oh, um, well, <laughs> I'm sure there's a whole story behind that, but you know, I, I'm trained as a, as a family physician. So as a family physician, I, you know, I spent my training learning how to care for people from, you know, from pregnancy and birth all the way through growth and life stages and illness and, and, and then end of life. I mean, life is a spectrum. So I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm trained to deal with people all the way along that spectrum. I, I've personally always been really drawn to the intersection between medicine, ethics, and law. And for much of my career, that was in women's health and reproductive rights. But um, as many Canadians followed the stories through the years, when I saw the law changing in 2015 and 2016, I was really drawn to learn more about MAID. Um, and I found um, what really resonated with me is that um, as within with birth, I, I really felt that this was a way that we could empower patients. I'm a very big um, advocate for patient autonomy and patient choice. Um, and I really think um, that's a really important part of what I do to be an advocate to, for my patients, to be a resource for my patients, to really make sure they're aware of what's out there and help guide them and help them really make the best decisions for themselves. So family medicine is about you know, looking at the patient in the context of their family and their community and their values. And this really spoke to me and really resonated with me. So I wanted to learn more about it. And the more I learned about it, the more that was reinforced. And, uh, and that's, that's where I, that's now that's the bulk of what I do. Yeah, I was going to say, and then look where you are now. So that's, that's <laughs> great. <laughs> okay, so um, let's get back to a little bit more about case story. So Patrick, um, we want to know uh, why you decided to share case story and and what she thought about uh, having her story be told. Yeah. Um... <laughs> You know, I didn't really know what this would be. You know, like when I left Portland, what I knew was that this was going to be the last time I was going to see her. And there's, I think so often we wish we had one more day with somebody when they're gone. <laughs> we always wish we had more time. And I went into this knowing that this was my time um, and to, to make the most of that. Uh, and so I moved into a, a remote place and would just visit her every day and just have conversations. Um, and so I brought a camera more so for you know, Caleb, Riley's son, and, you know, the other great grandkids who didn't, you know, don't get the same chance to get to know her. Um, and I would just bring it with me and have conversations and like, hey, do you feel like talking today? Um, and, and it was just a really amazing way to be able to get into, you know, what she's learned in life and what she wanted to share with people. Um, as we then got into the made process, and that became, you know, the path that we were going to take, um, I had another conversation with her about, you know, are you comfortable with me continuing to, you know, document this? Um, and, and it was something that uh, we had many conversations about because I wanted to make sure that she was certainly okay with us filming these things, with us showing these things. Um, and it was something that she, uh, she was very supportive of uh, if she felt like it could help people. You know, like it was hard for her to talk about, but it was very much like, I trust you too. And if you think that this is important, like I'm totally, you know, happy for you to make whatever calls you want on what you film and how you show it and everything else. Um, and so it was, it was really powerful to be able to have so many of those conversations in such an open way um, with and without the camera throughout that process. And I think more than anything, I was more present <laughs> because I brought a camera, which is probably why I'm a filmmaker, because um, I just pay more attention and, and you know, I'm able to kind of see things through that lens. So, um, well, it didn't start out with the idea of making this film and sharing it with all of you today. Uh, I know that it's something that um, Riley has been very passionate about, um, advocating for people's choices. And, uh, and that was actually a lot of the inspiration um, is hearing from her and her perspective on it and then witnessing it firsthand and just feeling like there's, there's not enough dialogue out there and there's not enough showing the reality of it and that you know that this is a choice yeah and and now it's such a like you said such a special gift that your family can cherish and I mean it's definitely important to share and Riley I was just gonna ask you and I I think Patrick you kind of touched on it but you know why you think it's so important uh to share Kay's story if you want to 
share with us? Something that um, I will always remember from my last time with my grandma would be um, how many times she thanked me and would say, I don't know what people going through this who didn't have someone like you there for them would do because she had no idea that maid was even an option. I, I talked to her about it. I talked to her about the different possibilities and helped her get set up with the coordinator and everything else. And I can just remember many times her just saying like, how many people, well, you know, she lost so many of her friends and family over the years and seen a lot of pain and suffering herself and just had never, never heard of this thing that she thought, wow, I think this could have helped a lot of other people too, that just, but there's this lack of awareness in certain populations that could probably really, really use it, you know? So um, I think that was a big thing that hit home for me was, you know, how, how much more people need to know about this and know that, you know, it's a possibility and be able to access it. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I'm sure now, um, you know, folks having seen Kay's journey will more people will know and it'll continue to, you know, spread the word about MAID and, and end of life options. Mm-hmm. Um, Stephanie, let me ask you, um, in the MAID provisions that you've, you've been a part of or you've, you've done, have you ever experienced a family um, filming or documenting the end of life journey the way uh, Patrick and Riley did? Well, just like every birth, I would tell you that every death is very unique and every family is very unique. So, so, so nothing like this, no. I mean, I've seen some extraordinary, some extraordinary moments, many of which were very, very beautiful. Um, and a lot of what you've talked about and, and described and shown us in case story, I have seen that type of that type of um, that type of closure that families get, that type of ability for for patients to say what they really want to say to the ones around them, usually very positive, but not always. Mm-hmm. Um, and and to give that opportunity for families to come together and and express those those things. I, I've seen celebrations with music and mimosas. And I've seen Hawaiian luas. I've seen lots of creativity, uh, but generally speaking, um, I've not had anybody filming their event. Uh, so this is quite unique. And um, and I think uh, there's just many. I think like like any person is unique. I think what they want at the end can be unique and needs to be adapted to each person and each personality and each situation. Um, and we try very hard to accommodate whatever is necessary. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Okay, switching it back over. Thank you, Patrick. How did you balance? uh, Because I mean, just as a viewer, and I'm sure for everyone else out there who's watching, it was emotional just just to watch. And this was the first time I could watch it and hold it together. But um, how did you balance the emotions that you felt during such an intense time in your life um, with the desire to, to tell Kay's story? A lot of preparation, <laughs> um, a lot of uh, really thinking about what was going to happen before I went every day and being really clear on what was important and why and, and how I wanted to be there, how I needed to show up. Um, and so there were certain things that, you know, we would all hang out and it was like, this is not a time to have a camera or, you know, to, to be bringing that element. And we're just going to be here. And, you know, we had a movie night and played music and, you know, that was just like, let's just be there. Um, And then even at the beginning of the procedure, I was like, I wanted to be there with her. Um, And then at a certain point, I had mentally rehearsed (laughs) that like, this is when you have to, you know, pick up a camera again. Um, And reminding myself that, you know, the hard parts are what we need to show. The hard parts are why there isn't enough conversation, why people have a hard time having a dialogue. Um, And that's what the, you know, that's really what I hope people see in this film Um, is that like this can be a conversation it can be something that you can talk about and how much um, that helps people when there's a dialogue Mm -hmm. yeah absolutely Um, Stephanie another question for you Um, so this film gives people the unique opportunity to understand some of the thoughts that people have uh, who have chose made have near the end of their lives Um, but what would you say are some of the common things that people say leading up to their own uh, medically assisted death. Well, so again, there's so many different yeah. ways to answer that. I, I mean, I think initially, what maybe what you're asking me about what I what I hear from people is that they're mm-hmm. they're fearful of more decline. They feel that um, 
people often tell me that they feel that they're existing more than they're living. They've, they've kind of lost that ability to find any um, meaningful activity or, or element in their life anymore. And that's why they're thinking of assisted dying or they've come to a place in their suffering where they, they realize there's only more dec decline in front of them and they'd like to have some say in when, when that will stop. But I, but I would just, I don't know if, what you, if it's what you're asking me, but I just want to pick up on what Riley and, and Patrick have been saying. I think what's so important, what I hear the most from patients when I sit down and, and speak with them, even if it's by Zoom these days, when I have that open and honest conversation about what their choices could be, what assisted dying looks like, what the process is, what the procedure is, what palliative care is, and actually allow people to talk to me about what's important to them and why they've asked to see me and have that open, honest dialogue with a clinician, people are really surprised that they can do that. Uh, many, many of my patients have never had that conversation with a clinician before in such an honest way. And what I, what I mostly hear, to be honest, is, is, um, is relief and gratitude for the ability to have that. I mean, Riley, you gave your grandmother an amazing opportunity, your experience was so valuable to her. So many people don't have that, um, that you could add that element was really extraordinary. Un unfortunately, most patients I see haven't had that ability. So I see a lot of relief, a lot of gratitude for that, just to explore it. And I find that conversation itself um, is therapeutic for patients, just to know that they can do that. And then to know that they have options, whether they make good on those options or whether they go down any pathway is almost secondary. The fact that they could consider that they have options is very empowering to patients. And I, I, I hear feedback from patients and families about that the most. Right. Yeah. Kelsey, welcome back. I just want to check in and see if you can hear us and see us. Yes. Can you hear me? Yes. Perfect. Sorry about that, folks. Technology is great, but uh, sometimes there are some hiccups, so glad to be back. Great. Okay, so let's continue on um, with our questions. And one um, that I, I personally wanted to know is how, Riley, I'll, I'll direct this at you, is um, how did Kay feel about filming? I know Patrick kind of touched on it, but I, I'd be interested to know uh, her thoughts around it. Okay, felt about filming the whole experience. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think she was a little nervous to begin with. Um, but having Patrick as her grandson, she was no stranger to being in front of a camera. <laughs> and um, at the end of the day, anything that could help anybody was always paramount for her. And um, Patrick has an incredible way to um, make you somehow forget that you're being filmed. <laughs> so, he, you know, he really made her feel comfortable. And um, once everything was put together, I mean, now seeing how he was able to portray it and just the, the emotion and the feeling of everything, he did such a beautiful job. Like, I, I think she would be nothing but very, very proud of you as she always was. <laughs> Thanks for that, Riley. Um, I have a, a question, uh, again, for you, Riley, and then Stephanie, maybe you can chime in as well with your, your experiences. But um, Riley, as a healthcare provider, what observations have you had about people's level of understanding about death and dying and perhaps their comfort level about having those discussions and, and thinking and talking about what uh, might happen at end of life? This is a tough one for me. Um, I, I am almost embarrassed to say that even now, I still find a lot of healthcare providers are even uncomfortable talking about uh, end of life. Um, being an ICU nurse, we have a lot of uh, situations where these conversations should be being had and being had earlier. And uh, whether it's that people are uncomfortable or uh, uneducated, um, I'm not really sure where that line is in between, but a lot of the time the conversations just aren't happening um, until somebody comes along that sees the situation and goes, wow, why haven't we talked about this? Why hasn't this been brought up? Um, so that, that's a piece for me that, you know, I, I'm, I'm, trying to ignite a little change in my own small circle, but um, I, I just feel like 
if we could make people more comfortable with talking about death, it's still, I don't know if it's a superstition that people think about, think if we have the conversation, maybe it's going to bring it on. So let's just not talk about it. Uh, but at the end of the day, it's happening to all of us. So we might as well talk about it and try to make it as, as peaceful and, um, you know, out of any, any end of life experience I've ever had, what we were be able to do for my grandma in her final days was just so incredible knowing knowing when it was going to happen and then being able to offer her you know what do you want to do on your last day what do you want to talk about what do you want to see what do you want you know who it was just it was a really really incredible way to do it because you knew that when she went she had said those things to those people that she wanted to say you know there were no conversations or questions left and I think that that is just an incredible gift to, to give somebody in this world. So yeah. hopefully we can make more people comfortable about talking about it and bringing it up because I feel like patients, once they hear about it, it's just such a beautiful option. Yeah, I, I, I would echo what Riley says. I think, you know, it's been, it's been four and a half years now. It's, it's, it's a, it still astounds me how many people are unaware. I, I do see a change in the healthcare community from four years ago. I mean, certainly initially there was even more reluctance to talk about it. There's certainly an element of, of discomfort, I think overall, uh, healthcare workers are humans and, and they're also uncomfortable. I think especially in the beginning, there was a lack of information and people didn't feel comfortable addressing the issues if they weren't informed. And I, I think we've made some headway there, which I'm glad to, glad to see. But I think um, we should look historically and, and notice, you know, there are some pretty courageous women uh, who stepped forward to change our law in our country. Going back to Sue Rodriguez, you know, to Kay Carter, to Gloria Taylor. These are these are people who fought for this um, this choice and this right. And and I think it reminds me that events like this, uh, conversations started by, by documentaries and things where people become informed. I really believe there's a role for patients and people to play to help educate healthcare providers. It's when the patients come and demand to know more about something that healthcare providers start to listen and get educated. So I, I think it goes both ways. It's a two-way conversation and, and effort needs to come from both sides. And I, I totally agree with what Riley said. It's, it's a combination of fear and, uh, and lack of information, which I think is starting to improve, but we all have a role to play in, in, in improving it further. Yeah. Thank you both. And yeah, I mean, Riley, what you were saying about, you know, the final days and, uh, or the final day and, you know, Kay being able to not leave anything left unsaid. I mean, that just gives me goosebumps personally and what a beautiful um, way to go. Um, Patrick, I'm just wondering, um, were you familiar with MAID uh, prior to Kay's experience? No, <clears throat> I, I mean, I, I um, knew that some things like this existed in some places of the world <laughs> uh, and, and had some, uh, you know, had had those come up in, in the past, um, but I wasn't aware of, you know, exactly what was available and being that I live in Portland, Oregon, um, you know, definitely wasn't up to date with with what was current or anything else. So uh, I became educated very much as grandma did. <laughs> uh, you know, we were there for the, the consults when the doctors came in and, you know, asked all the questions and kind of did the interview process. Um, and so I personally got to learn so much about it along with her. Thank you. Thanks for that. Um, and, and this next question is for um, both Patrick and, and Riley. So maybe Riley, if you wanted to, to go first. Uh, what was the most difficult part of the experience for you and for Kay? Most difficult part of the experience. Um, that's a tough one. <laughs> you know, being completely honest, the most difficult part of the experience was before made actually became a part of it. You know, there was, there was so much suffering and so many appointments with so many things being offered to her in terms of further treatment that she just didn't want. And to see that look in her eyes, when that doctor would offer her another infusion or another procedure, or another 
medication that, you know, everything wasn't working and she just had more and more pain. And I could see her look at me for this, this sense of approval. Like, is it okay if I say no, I just don't want to do it. And I would give her that, you know, Graham, it's your body, it's your choice. And that was the hardest point, watching her just go through all this and feeling that hopelessness once made actually became a part of it. Um, honestly, that, that was the easy part because she had suffered for so long and yeah, it was just this beautiful gift to be able to give her in the end. So yeah, the, the main part was the easy part. <laughs> Yeah, I would I would say that, you know, um, all along those lines, you know, she was just so damn tough that the hardest part was like helping her, like she <laughs> would just getting her to actually open up to what was going on. You know, she would be constantly walking around because she was in so much pain and you'd be like, hey, like, can we do anything? She's like, oh, no, it's fine. Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. You're like, but you can't even sit down because you're in so much pain. Like, let us know. Um, and even in the last couple of days, like she, she wrote a note to the superintendent in her building and taped it on his door, letting her know that, letting them know that she was moving out, like that she wouldn't need, you know, we're like, we can do this for you. You do not need to like manage everything, but she was just so tough and like wanted to handle it all herself. Um, and that was, that was the hardest part for me because it's like, where do you step in and just show up early and start doing it for her? Where do you, you know, you want to make sure you're respecting what she wants, but knowing that she has a hard time letting us in and asking for help. Uh, so it was always a balance and really just trying to give her time and space to like, are you sure? <laughs> I'm seeing these things. Are you sure there's nothing else you want to talk about? Um, and you see, you see that um, a little bit of that in the film, right? Where, you know, she's like, oh, I'm not tough. I won't say that again, you know, and, and, you know, that kind of playful, you know, it took a lot to really get her to uh, open up to some of those things. Thank you. It's, it's so great to not only watch her in the film and get to know a little bit about her, but to have the context from the two of you as her, as her family here today. It, it's so, it brings so much more to the experience getting to talk to the two of you. So we, we appreciate that. And I'm sure the audience does as well. Um, a question for Stephanie, what things should people consider before deciding to move forward with MAID? Oh, I think like every decision, every healthcare decision, I think people need to consider all the issues. I mean, for example, if somebody's struggling and in extreme pain because of a diagnosis, you know, we need to first treat the issue of what's going on as best we can. We need to get that pain under control as best we can before we can go into another decision about other end of life choices. The people that I see don't make snap decisions, right? So um, these are, these are uh, decisions that take often weeks or months and sometimes years people have been considering their choices and they don't come to it quickly. And I think people have some preconceived notions about what they could or couldn't accept in the future. You know, if I can't do this, if I can't get out of bed, then I wouldn't want to be living anymore. That wouldn't be life to me. But the truth is many of my patients find that when they get to that situation, they actually have a lot of inner resources or they find a way to accept some help and they, they do want to continue on. So I, I would say people need to need to enter their end of life choices with an open mind, um, you know, to, to be willing to hear about other options, to explore all those options, or at least to seriously consider them. Um, I think it's important that people hear about the chemotherapy and the surgery and the transfusions that they may not want, but they do, I, I do think people need to know about what's out there. I think an informed decision nece necessarily involves really good information about all the options. So I would say people need to need to make those explorations before they make final decisions and just to do so with an open mind. That's key. Great, thank you, Stephanie. Uh, we're going to move on to some of the audience questions that have been coming in today. Um, I would like to say that there are quite a few coming in about um, what's going on with the assisted dying legislation. And we, we do really want to focus on the incredible story that we heard today. So um, that won't be a, a major focus of the, the information that we give out or the questions that we'll be responding to. But we do have resources on our website. You're also welcome to reach out to us if you did have specific questions related to the legislation that's, uh, that's moving through the system right now. 
So we have a question, and I, I think this question would be great for all of you if you could chime in, um, and maybe we'll start with Patrick, but what would you tell other families that might be struggling with a loved one's decision to access need? Um, be curious and provide space. I think that when things like this happen, we don't ask enough questions of, of the person that's going through it, uh, what the reality is like, how they're doing. Um, and we often don't really listen to them. <laughs> we prepare how we feel or what we want to happen and we reply so quickly. Um, and we saw that with my grandma, you know, certain people that wouldn't even ask her what was going on. They would just tell her what she should be doing. Um, and so I think there's just so much power in just being curious and providing that space and just trying to understand their experience um, and giving them enough time to show that like you really care and you really want to know. You're not looking for the everything's fine. Don't worry about it. You're, you're looking to actually understand how they are and how you can support. Um, and if you stick with that for a while, people really open up. And it, and it makes a world of a difference. I think you Hi. nailed that one, Patrick. <laughs> I have to agree. I think curiosity and lack of judgment, validation of whatever they say, you, you nailed it, Patrick. That's exactly it. The only thing I would want to add would be um, try not to bring your own fear into it. Because a lot of the time um, I see family members um, and it's no fault of their own. It's out of love for the person. Um, but, uh, you know, because they don't want to lose the person, um, they want more time with the person. And instead of focusing on the fact that, you know, this is their decision and it's about their life and their experience and what they're having to go through, you can sometimes make it about yourself. And um, I think just trying to trying to remember that it's not about you anymore and that your role is to try to try to support that person in the best way that you can. Great, thanks everyone. Um, this is just a, a nice comment that I wanted to share um, from, from someone who says, not a question, but I just wanted to thank you, say thank you to all the dedicated need providers. So just thought I'd share that with Stephanie um, and uh, all of the other, um, I know there's some healthcare providers and, and uh, made assessors and providers on the call today. So just that, uh, thank you to everyone. Um, another question that came through and, and Stephanie, if you could answer this is a, a bit more information on the, what the made medications are um, and, and what that looks like. Yeah, sure. So, so there's actually two options in Canada to have a, a, um, a made procedure. The first is, is not commonly used and it's an oral drink. It's a barbiturate that will make you fall asleep. I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on that because very few people have actually chosen that. I think people are mostly curious about the intravenous route. Um, and without going into the exact detail of the doses and things, I would say that it's a, there's, a, there's, a, there's just a fairly standard uh, prescription that's followed and essentially involves four medications. The first medication is an anti-anxiety medication. It allows people to feel really, really relaxed when they get it. So generally symptom-free, very, very comfortable. And most people, of course, with the dose we use will fall into a really comfortable light sleep. Um, and, uh, and that's really very reassuring for family members to, to see and, and to see their loved one relaxed, possibly for the first time in a long time. The second medication that's uh, optional but commonly used is just to numb the vein that we're using to make sure that the patient's not aware of any irritation. And, and often it's not needed because the patient's asleep, but most of us use it just to be 100% sure because we're not 100% sure what they're still feeling. Um, the third medication is the predominant medication. It is the medication that's normally used to help someone fall asleep for, for an operation. It's used in a very, very high dose. Uh, and as we give that medication, the patient goes from that light sleep that they're in down into a much deeper sleep, into a deep unconscious state. Um, and, and during that time, we, we do expect for breathing to space out and to stop and for patients to die. And that's traditionally what happens in the bulk of uh, the vast majority of cases. We do actually follow a protocol that has a fourth medication that makes sure there's no muscular movement in the body and it, it kind of ensures the process is complete. Um, it's based on the Dutch protocol and we know that when we use it in order uh, that we're 100% effective if we're, if we're in the vascular system. So it's a it's a... It's a protocol that we use that's based on our European colleagues and their experience and we, we feel very confident in. Uh, it's very gentle, uh, it's very comfortable. There's no 
no twitching or coughing or anything like that. It's very, very peaceful, very, very dignified uh, going to sleep. Thanks, Stephanie. Um, speaking of, you know, um, access to MAID, I know we had touched on it earlier. Um, and Riley, maybe this one is best directed at you um, because Kay did live uh, in a small town. Did you have any trouble with access to assessments and um, MAID providers, MAID assessors? Was the process, you know, essentially seamless? What was the experience like? Um, it, it, once we got started, uh, the, the issue with the process, I think was more that, or that I, that I found an issue was that, uh, nobody in her, uh, circle of healthcare providers had ever brought this up for her or even palliative care at that point. Um, so once I started asking those questions, um, I remember actually even her family physician, um, calling me and saying, you know, are you sure she wants this? And he was even uncomfortable with it himself. Um, but once everybody was on board that this is what she wanted and um, could see that how much she wanted it, um, everything was pretty seamless and we were able to get the supports in place fairly easily and quickly. That's what I was actually very impressed with how um, uh, quickly we were accommodated for the whole process. I would just like to add, because it's just such a cute story about Kay. Well, we were there with the doctor um, and they go through the, you know, it was the second interview and he had approved her. She was, she had a big sense of relief and she didn't think that she would get approved. Um, he was from a town that was about an hour away. And so uh, the next question then is like, when would you like to do this? Right. And so she was like, well, but when are you in town next? And he's like, no, no, no. Like, Kay, I will, I will come there for you. Like you can decide. Like, no, 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 I don't want to trouble you. When are you in town next? We'll do it then. <laughs> so he was in town the next Thursday and she's like, Yo, no, that, that will work fine. I don't want to trouble you. <laughs> that is so funny and just really shows what kind of person she was. That's, thanks for sharing that. I have to say, I really loved in the video uh, when she looked up at, at her provider and, sa and said, what do you think's on the other side? Like, what a... What a question and then answered it herself. I guess, we, I guess we don't know. I thought that was really sweet. And yeah, I really liked that. All right, we just have a couple questions left before we, uh, before we call it a day. But uh, one question that we would really like to hear is, how do you think sharing Kay's story will impact people differently than just sharing facts about medical assistance and dying? And maybe Patrick, if you wanted to get us started with that. Yeah, well, so my background is actually studying the science of storytelling. Um, so uh, I won't go into the specific dosages like Stephanie didn't, but uh, a story is, is perceived by the brain in a very different way than facts. Um, and so when we're told facts, we put up rational arguments and counterpoints. Whereas when we're told a great story, um, there's a suspension of disbelief and we are just transported into that person's experience giving us a chance to just experience the reality and, and feel what it was like to be them for a moment. And I think that's the power in a story like this, that you can suspend all of your judgments and your preconceived ideas for four and a half minutes um, and actually just experience what her life was like. And what can happen is that then shift your, your, your beliefs, your perception after you get that moment to kind of walk in her shoes. So um, I think it, it is a really powerful way at letting people experience the real lived experience of this, as opposed to the cold clinical facts of what a whole bunch of people have seen. Thanks, Patrick. Does any, I was just, Riley, did you have anything to add to that? Or Stephanie, you know, facts or storytelling over facts? I think just as Patrick said, it just makes it so much more real. Um, getting to see her in her home and, um, hear her thoughts and feelings in that that last time and um for me you know just you seeing the bruises on her face and um how how thin she had become and all that like it just it just in every way just makes it so much more real instead of you know like Patrick said just the the cold clinical facts Mm -hmm. I think a lot of the time it's hard to imagine what this topic really means. And as Patrick says, stories are incredibly powerful. They, they, they give us a window where we can actually 
kind of relate or project ourselves into a situation or someone's situation and imagine is there someone in my family like that? What if I were there? You know, do I know anyone who's been through that? There's so many ways we can connect with the story um, so much more easily than, than a fact on a piece of paper. I think stories are incredibly powerful. And I think stories like Kay's uh, have the possibility of, of really connecting with people and, and bringing them to the topic to, to consider further conversations and, and uh, you know, really increase this uh, awareness. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, as we're nearing the end here, um, Patrick, I think we'll direct this last question at you. And I mean, we've touched on it so much uh, throughout our, our time here, but um, what is the one thing that you hope people will take away uh, from the film? So the, the story was told in a conversational format um, where you hear me talking to her and asking her questions and responding because the hope was that it would create conversations, that it was done not as you know one person just telling us, but that you would actually get to witness and see a lot of that dialogue. Um, and so that's what I hope more than anything is that people just have more conversations about this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, Riley, Stephanie, um, do you have any last comments or, or, or anything you wanna add before we uh, thank our audience? I would, just, I would just reiterate thanks to the family for being so courageous and bringing this story forward. I think, again, in the audience and, and out in the public, no matter how you think about this topic, I think the most important thing is that conversation is generated. And so I really applaud Muse and Patrick and his team for making this documentary and starting the conversation and keeping it going. I think that's the most important thing that can come out of an event like this and of Kay's story. Um, and if it helps people understand their own situation, that, that's even better. That is exactly it. Yeah, we just need to keep talking about it and raise awareness and hopefully uh, help anybody else who's who's suffering in those situations who don't know about this, uh, yeah, allow them that same beautiful gift. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, um, on that note, I would just like to thank Patrick and Riley, both of you so much for being here and sharing your grandmother's story. Um, I'm sure it touched everybody uh, and, you know, it was so powerful. So thank you for sharing and thank you, uh, Stephanie and Camap um, and Muse. This was, I think, a great success and hopefully we can continue to have more events similar to this. So thank you all again for being here and for sharing Kay's story and to our audience, thank you for attending and for spending the hour with us. Um, it was much appreciated. Everybody have a great afternoon and stay safe. Thank you. Thanks. Bye.